Lux lucid in tenebris. Light shines in darkness. The Waldensian motto can be found inscribed in all the valley churches today. It serves as a silent reminder of their faithful and often blood-stained witness down through the centuries. However, the prophetic symbol of the woman in the wilderness applied not only to the Waldenses. It included all those whose faith in God and in his word set them against the corruptions and false teachings of the professing church. A year before Luther nailed his theses to the castle church door, the Reformation began in Switzerland with the preaching of Ulrich Zwingli. He spoke out against the sale of indulgences and other papal abuses and taught that salvation comes through faith in Christ alone. But it wasn't from Luther that he learned these things. It was through his study of scripture. In the German states, Luther towered above all his fellow reformers. But in the Swiss cantons, many godly men became champions of the faith. Several of the outstanding leaders are remembered here at the Reformation Monument in Geneva. William Farrell, called by some the Luther of French Switzerland. John Calvin and Theodore Beza, Calvin's successor and biographer. Calvin was born in France and was led to the Reformed faith by his cousin Peter Oliveton who was later to translate the Bible into French for the Waldenses. At the age of 25, Calvin went to Basel in Switzerland. There he completed and published what was probably the most influential single volume of the Protestant Reformation, the institution of the Christian religion. His aim was to set out the great teachings of the Christian faith as he believed they were before they had been corrupted by the Church of Rome. In 1536, Calvin was appointed pastor and professor in Geneva. St. Peter's Cathedral became his pulpit. But his words were not limited to the confines of this building. During the last 25 years of his life, Calvin attempted to make Geneva a model city of Christianity in practice. Under his influence, Geneva became a center for the reformed faith in Europe. He also established a college in Geneva which attracted students from all over Europe. On completion of their studies, they returned to their homelands to scatter the principles of the Reformation. One such student who came as a refugee from Scotland was John Knox. He became a close friend, an ardent disciple of Calvin. Like Paul of old at the stoning of Stephen, John Knox was directed to his life work by the martyrdom of the Scottish gospel preacher, George Wishart. Here in front of the castle of St Andrews, the letters GW mark the spot where Wishart was burned at the stake in 1546. Later Knox returned to Scotland and came here to St Andrews, which in the 16th century was the ecclesiastical centre of Scotland. Its cathedral was one of the largest in all Christendom. Within a year, the castle's inhabitants had invited Knox to become their preacher. Early in 1547, he preached his first sermon here in the parish church of St Andrews. It was to mark the beginning of the Reformation in Scotland. It is no coincidence that Knox took as his text the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. At the beginning of his sermon, he showed the great love of God for his people in warning them in advance of dangers that would threaten the church. He identified the four beasts as the four great empires of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and then spoke of the little horn power to follow, which he identified as the papal antichrist. In so doing, Knox firmly placed himself in the line of great reformers like Wycliffe, Huss, 
Luther, Calvin and many others who had declared the same. Some 13 years later, the Scottish Parliament met at the toll booth. Its site was over there, adjacent to the Church of St Giles in Edinburgh, where John Knox was the preacher. Six Scottish reformers, who by a remarkable coincidence, each bore the Christian name of John, had drawn up a confession of faith, which was formally adopted by the Parliament in August 1560. The Mass was forbidden, and the Protestant faith was established in Scotland. However, the new monarch, Mary, Queen of Scots, with her strong Roman Catholic background, had other plans. When she ordered the celebration of Mass, Knox thundered his objections from the pulpit here at St Giles Cathedral. Queen Mary summoned Knox to appear before her at Holyrood Palace, not far from St Giles. Mary, like other monarchs of her day, believed she ruled by divine right and that the consciences of her people were subject to her control. The confrontation between Mary and Knox was therefore crucial to the survival of the Reformation in Scotland. You have taught the people to receive another religion than that which their princes allow, but God commands subjects to obey their prince. Madam, right religion received neither its origin nor its authority from princes, but from the eternal God alone. So subjects are not bound to friend their religion according to the tests of princes, for often it is that princes of all others are the most ignorant of God's true religion. Aye, but yours is not the Kirk I will nourish. I will defend the Kirk of Rome, for it is, I think, the true Kirk of God. Your will, madam, is no reason. Neither doth it make that Roman harlot the true and immaculate spouse of Jesus Christ. The Kirk of Rome is declined from that religion that the apostles taught and planted. My conscience is not so. Conscience, madam, requires knowledge, and a right knowledge I fear ye have none. You interpret the scripture in one way, and they interpret it in another. Whom shall I believe, and who shall be judge? You shall believe God, who plainly speaketh in his word. If in any one place there be obscurity, the Holy Ghost explains the same more clearly in other places, so that there can remain no doubt but under such as are obstinately ignorant. Luther before Charles V at Worms and Knox before Queen Mary at Holyrood were among the most dramatic moments in the Reformation. In both instances, victory went to individuals who had an overwhelming faith in God and in the truth of his cause. The spiritual conflict continued in all the lands of Europe in the 16th century. In England, the formal reformation which came with Henry VIII's break with Rome in 1534 was largely political. But in the years that followed, men arose who were determined to bring the church in England back to the principles of the Bible. It was not to be without fierce opposition. Henry's daughter, Mary Tudor, came to the throne in 1553 and immediately set about returning England to the Roman Church. During her five-year reign, some 300 Protestants were burnt at the stake. John's description of the church from the time of the cross onwards portrays God's people being accused by Satan and enduring great suffering even unto death. Here in the churchyard is the Martyr's Memorial. It records the death of some 18,000 martyrs for Jesus Christ. About a hundred of them were executed in Edinburgh, and most of them are buried here. But then John goes on to add these triumphant words in Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. There were three men in England whose martyrdom may represent all those who did not shrink from death during the long years of persecution.
In Oxford stands the Martyr's Memorial to Nicholas Ridley, Bishop of London, Hugh Latimer, a chaplain to Henry VIII, and Thomas Cranmer, the first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury. All three died at the stake, erected in Broad Street, at the spot marked by this cross, just opposite Balliol College, where John Wycliffe had taught nearly 200 years earlier. In Oxford town the faggots they piled with furious haste and with curses wild round two brave souls who could keep their tryst through a pathway of fire to follow Christ. And the flames leapt up, but the blinding smoke could knock the soul of Hugh Latimer joke. For said he, Brother Ridley, be of good cheer. A candle in England is lighted here which by grace of God shall never go out. And that speech in whispers was echoed about. Latimer's light shall never go out, however the winds may blow it about. Latimer's light has come to stay till the trump of a coming judgment day. And so it was to be. Within three years, Mary Tudor was dead and Queen Elizabeth I had ascended the throne, ushering in the dawn of England's golden age. She determined to return England to her father's ways, and with such diligence that the Catholic powers of Europe began to plot her downfall. Philip II, son of Charles V, prepared the greatest invasion force the world had ever seen, the Spanish Armada. Late in July 1588, the watchers along the high ground above Plymouth Harbour caught their first glimpse of the 130 vessels sailing up the channel. Under the leadership of Sir Francis Drake, the English fleet put to sea and engaged the enemy, though vastly outnumbered and outgunned. In a series of battles over the next 10 days, the smaller English ships caused great havoc among Spain's cumbersome galleons. Desperately seeking to get clear of the English attacks, the disorganised armada headed for the open sea, only to be struck by one of the fiercest storms in maritime history. Whirled along the coast of Norway, dashed against the rocks of the Shetlands, the Orkneys and the Hebrides, and swept back south toward Ireland, it was an armada that was fleeing, though no man was pursuing. Of the 30,000 men aboard, scarcely 10,000 returned to Spain. Philip II and the Catholic kingdoms were stunned. But the Protestant states joined in a chorus of thanksgiving. At Queen Elizabeth's command, the 29th of November was set aside as a day to render thanks unto God. The Queen herself rode through the streets of London to St Paul's Cathedral and hence to Paul's Cross. After the sermon, she addressed her subjects, exhorting them to join her in praising God, who had scattered her enemies and protected her realm. Here in Plymouth, on the monument commemorating the sighting of the Armada, these cryptic words have been inscribed. He blew with his winds, and they were scattered. The departure of the Mayflower in 1620 from Plymouth, England, with all these people on board, was a far cry from the events of 1588 when the Spanish Armada sailed by. Yet it too is related to the saga of the woman clothed with the sun. During the latter part of Queen Elizabeth's reign, the population was divided between those who remained loyal to the official Church of England and those who desired the reformation of the Church to continue based upon the authority of Scripture. Known as Puritans and Separatists, these nonconformists were eventually persecuted for their beliefs and many emigrated to Holland. Among these were the Pilgrim Fathers, who sailed aboard the Mayflower from Holland via Plymouth Harbour, bound for the New World. 
When the Puritans first separated from the English church, they had solemnly covenanted to walk together in all God's ways, made known to them, or to be made known. Here was the vital principle of Protestantism. Before they sailed from Holland in 1620, their pastor John Robinson delivered his farewell sermon. He pointed out that the followers of Luther, Knox and Calvin had settled on the teachings of these men as if they were the sum of all truth. Speaking of the reformers, Robinson said, They penetrated not into the whole counsel of God, but were they now living, would be as willing to embrace further light as that which they first received. If God should reveal anything to you by any other instrument of his, be ready to receive it, for I am very confident the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth from his holy word. Little could he have understood the real significance of his words. More truths were indeed to break forth from God's word, and the Puritans had a vital part to play. The Pilgrim Fathers stepped ashore at Plymouth Rock on December the 21st, 1620. They were the first of many thousands of 17th century Puritans who immigrated to the New World and brought with them beliefs which in due time would contribute to the rise of a religious movement that would encircle the world. According to the prophecy in Daniel 7, the little horn power would be supreme in Europe for 1260 years. At the end of that period, extending from 538 to 1798, events would temporarily end this supremacy. Right on time, in February 1798, General Berthier's French army entered Rome, took the Pope prisoner, and greatly reduced the authority and power of the papacy. Likewise, in John's prophecy in Revelation 12, the woman clothed with the sun would be in the wilderness for 1260 years. After 1798, a movement teaching the same great truths taught by the apostles, prophets and early Christians was to emerge. The great truths such as salvation by God's grace through faith in Christ alone, the high priestly ministry of Christ, the royal priesthood of all believers, obedience to all the commandments of God, believers' baptism, and the sufficiency and authority of Scripture above tradition were among those taught in the early church. Such teachings, lost by many through the great apostasy, were to be restored and proclaimed to the world in its final judgment hour. Jesus said that the gospel must be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. The climax of the long-standing conflict between Christ and Satan is described in Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus. The biblical concept of remnant is a group of people in any age who have survived calamity and are loyal to God and the principles of his word in a time of apostasy. However, the setting of Revelation 12, 17 makes it clear that the remnant of this verse refers to the spiritual descendants of the woman in the time of the end, that is, after 1798. They are the spiritual heirs of the long and worthy line of God's chosen people that have survived the fierce onslaughts of the dragon down through history. The work of the Reformation then did not end with Luther, Knox, the Puritans, or with the Pilgrim Fathers setting sail for the New World. It is an ongoing process, and its next phase points us to early 19th century America and to the rise of a prophetic movement that rapidly captured the attention of many around the world.